Hi, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm David. I'm a partner at Seven Sage, and I am so pleased today to host Sean McShay of Boston College Law. Sean McShay is the Assistant Dean for Graduate Enrollment Management Aid at Boston College Law School. He earned his BS and MBA from West Virginia Wesleyan College. Dean McShay has built his career advising tens of thousands of prospective students on the law school admissions process mm -hmm. and about how to finance a legal education. Mm -hmm. With firsthand knowledge of multiple legal markets, including Washington, D.C., New York City, and Boston, he has developed unique skills at some of the country's top legal institutions. Dean McShay currently serves as the chair of the annual meeting of law school diversity professionals and has held multiple leadership positions with the LSAC. He most recently served as the chair of LSAC's annual meeting and educational conference 2019 planning work group and is a member of the misconduct and irregularities in the admissions process subcommittee. Dean McShay, <laughs> welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, David. I appreciate the <laughs> welcome. <laughs> So I was hoping that you could start just by telling us a little bit more about Boston College Law School. Okay, sure. So um, we are just about 90 years old. We were founded in about 1929, uh, located right down on 11 Beacon Street in downtown Boston. Uh, so uh, just a few decades later, we moved to what is known as the Chestnut Hill Campus, which is... Uh, also known as our main campus. And then in 1974, um, after the purchase of uh, the Newton Campus for Sacred Heart, uh, we moved to our current location, which is the Newton Campus for Boston College Law School. The Newton Campus is about 40 acres. Uh, it is academically exclusive to law students. Uh, and there's a shuttle system that runs between the campuses, which make it really convenient for students who live in the area or for students who live a little bit farther out. Um, the law school is a medium-sized law school. We have about 750 students overall. Uh, we typically have an incoming class around 250. Uh, and that's the goal from here for the foreseeable future. Um, about 250 students in each class. We also have an LLM program, which is a graduate legal studies program. Uh, and we have a whole host of international scholars that also join the law school community. Uh, in terms of the curriculum, we offer about 19 different practice areas with well over about 200 elective courses for our students to choose from. So there's quite a variety uh, in terms of, you know, course selection and opportunities there. And we also enhance our academic experience uh, through clinical training where you're getting hands-on experience. There are 11 live client clinics at the law school. Uh, there are a number of advocacy programs that are offered uh, throughout your time as a student uh, at BC, but we also encourage our 1L students to get involved in some of those advocacy programs. So the competitions uh, where you're building skills. So we encourage our students to get involved in that from a very, a very early process. Then to continue on the, the notion of enhancing your academic experience uh, through hands-on experience, we have a whole host of internships and externship opportunities. Uh, in addition to that, we have a semester in practice program which allows our students to either study and or work in locations outside of the U.S. Uh, at a number of partner institutions and organizations. Great. Thanks for all that. You're welcome. Um, so Dean McShay, what I'm really hoping is that you can peel back the curtain on <laughs> the life of a law school admissions officer. Okay. My first question is just, uh, what are you doing right now? What's your schedule like? When do you start reading apps? Sure. What's going on over there? So right now we're gearing up for the recruitment season. So I typically think of the process uh, in, in cycles. So right now we're gearing up for the recruitment process. Uh, mem two members of my team are already out there on the road heading to different events around the country uh, in the Midwest uh, and, and, and in Philadelphia. Uh, after the recruitment process, which typically runs from early September to mid-November, 
we go right into the evaluation process, which is when every member of the admissions team, including the admissions committee, which is much broader than the admissions team, uh, they're all reading files. Uh, and since this is an, elect an electronic process, you read files everywhere. Wherever you get a moment, you, you start reading. Uh, we generally have in the neighborhood of about 5,000 applications or more, so it's a pretty sizable applicant pool, and we really do strive to make sure that we get those decisions out in a timely fashion. Uh, so I have all hands on deck uh, reading files from uh, probably about mid-October this year. So we're going to start it a little bit earlier. Uh, so from mid-October through the end of the cycle, we typically try to get through all of the applications before we get to our first uh, um, uh, deposit deadline. There are some instances where we can't do that in a given year, depending on volume and things, but we really do strive to get there. Um, to get all of the files reviewed. Uh, we try to do it within a three to five week process. On the earlier stages of it, it'll be a little bit longer because the committee's not reading, but once we get into the swing of things around the winter holiday break, we truly uh, begin to bring it down to the smaller uh, evaluation time frame. After the evaluation period, we're bringing students to campus. Uh, not to mention, we have campus visits every day, Monday through Friday, every business day, Monday through Friday at 12 noon. And we like to uh, couple those tours with uh, an opportunity to sit in on a class, an opportunity to speak with an admissions representative. If I am in the office, I typically meet with the tour group after the tour has, has taken place. So, you know, in the spring semester, after we've done the evaluation period, we are in the process of, you know, trying to, you know, showcase the school, bring students to campus, you know, show you all of the different programs that we have uh, that is coupled with the marketing program, as well as the on-campus visits and our admitted student days. And then once we have uh, dealt with that process, we go to the conversion and then the retention uh, part of our job. And then we start the whole cycle all over again. All right. <laughs> that was really thorough. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so we've heard from a lot of deans that it's better if you can apply early. My first question is, is that true in your experience? And my second question is, given that you're not expecting to read files until probably October 15th, mm -hmm. is there any difference between applying in September and, you know, applying in October? Uh, well, sure. So I think for an institution that has a rolling admissions basis, as we do, uh, when your application comes in is really, really important. Um, for schools who have a different type of process, it, it may not be as important. But I think a, a, a large percentage of law schools uh, right now do have a rolling admissions basis. And there might be different deadlines for specific programs uh, that are out there, but by and large, I think a lot of us have a rolling basis. Uh, the benefit of a rolling admissions operation is that, you know, we really do get to the first applications that come in first. So when I start the evaluation process on October 15th or sometime around that date, when I start sending files to my admissions committee, I'll be sending files that came in on September 15th, which is when we start. And so there is a difference between you starting and applying in September 15th versus October because you will be earlier in the cycle. For a school that has a large application volume and a really competitive admissions process, you know, we tend to have a lot more flexibility in the earlier age, uh, stages of the application process. So you know, for a student who might be marginal, for a student that we, you know, may be willing to take a chance on, we're probably a lot more likely to do that in the earlier stages, because as we get to the later portions of the cycle, we have all types of constraints and limitations that we then have to be more mindful of. And I think we're mindful of them throughout the cycle, because you've seen, you know, how the applications come in year after year. Um, but you have a lot less flexibility when you're down to the wire and you have only a small percentage of offers left and you are trying to pick the best candidates. So, so I think there's certainly benefit to applying early uh, in the admission cycle. That's really helpful. Thank you.
I'm wondering now if you could just walk us through the actual process um, of reviewing the files, you know, and, and even logistical stuff I think would be really interesting to the people here. So mm -hmm. once the files get there, you know, who reads them, how many people read them, sure. are you keeping score on a little bingo card? <laughs> tell, tell us what you can. Remember we all learned something about the scoring mechanisms in law admissions? No, um, there's no scoring mechanism, there's no point system. Um, but in all honesty, once a student kind of hits submit on their application, um, the first part of the cycle of that application is really circulating around my department. Uh, so, you know, my frontline admissions representatives, the people who answer the phones and the emails, um, those are the people who are looking at the documents that come in. They're making sure that we have all of the materials that we need for those students who may have, you know, selected a, a particular response that needs an addendum, you know, if they haven't provided that addendum excuse me, the admissions team will reach out to them to make sure that when we go into the evaluation process, we have all of the pieces to move forward with the evaluation very smoothly. Uh, and so all of that process happens immediately when a student hits submit. Uh, one member of, uh, actually two members of the team are looking through the application to comb through to make sure everything is there. Once that happens, another member of the team will then give the student a notification. If there's something missing, then you'll get an email about that. If things are all set, you'll get an email that says you are complete and here are your credentials. Your credentials, uh, you'll have credentials at every law school that you apply to that uses an application status checker, an online status checker. And so you can look in the system with the credentials that we provide to get a sense of where we are in the process. And we are pretty thorough about updating our statuses. So if an application comes in, it's just an incomplete and or application that's received. Once we go through the process and we realize that something is or is not there, if there's something that's missing, then your application will be incomplete and you get a checklist that, that gives you information for that. Uh, if your application is complete, uh, you, then, you know, learn that your application is complete and that it's ready for review. Uh, once it is ready for review, it can sit in that stage for a while, depending upon when your application came into the, the system and when we're going to send it to the admissions committee. But once we're ready to send it to the admissions committee, you'll see a status update there and uh, it'll go right to a member of our, our admissions committee. Now, speaking to the other part of your admissions committee, you know, who's looking at it? Well, certainly the admissions team is up among those that are members of the admissions committee, but we have a pretty robust faculty committee as well. Uh, faculty chair uh, and a pretty dynamic admissions committee. So the entire committee at its height I have probably about 16 to 18 people reviewing applications. Uh, and in some of the down periods and earlier periods, there may be, um, you know, four to five people who are reviewing applications. Each application typically has at least two to three sets of eyes that go on it, depending upon how the, the evaluation is going. Uh, and there are some students who have a lot more eyes that go on them because they're, you know, just the need to, to, to send it further down the pipeline. Uh, our committee, as I mentioned, there are faculty members, there's admissions members. Uh, we have you know, members of career services sit on the committee at different points of the cycle. We have members of academic affairs sit on the committee at different uh, points of the cycle. Our reference librarians, the majority of them are, are lawyers as well. And those are the people who work with uh, our students uh, throughout their time uh, in law school, they help with, you know, your research, they help with, you know, providing you, uh, providing our students with um, uh, uh, solutions to, you know, any writing uh, things that they might be working on. So they're re a really integral part of uh, the dynamic of the student experience. And so we tend to infuse a lot of uh, the people who make the law school work, you know, for the students into that evaluation process. Uh, in terms of 
uh, you asked, so what are we looking for in the process? You did say that, right? <laughs> I'm, I do want to know. <laughs> okay. So in terms of, you know, some of the things that we're looking for or how we review an application, that was your question. How we review an application, I think everyone has a slightly different process because you do what works best for you. Um, I am a visual person and as a function of being a visual person, I look at the resume first because I want uh, an applicant to set the stage for me. And I think that the resume is a very strategic tool where in that one page, or however many pages it is, uh, in, in that document, I'm able to quickly get a sense of, you know, where a student has been, what they've done, what their skills, uh, what type of skills they possess, sometimes what's some of their hobbies and awards and other accolades that they may have. Uh, certainly the work product. And so I'm able to get a lot of information from that document. And as a result of that, it sets the premise for all of the other things that I'm about to read. And so I go for the resume first because I like to have that, that set up. Then once I've had the setup, then I'm looking for the main attraction. I go right to the personal statement because I want to get more depth on the person that I think I just met through the resume. And, you know, I've heard some of my colleagues refer to the personal statement as, um, you know, an opportunity to interview, uh, you know, use it as an interview because that is your opportunity to tell your story. And I certainly think that there's some truth to that. Um, but as with an interview, but once we've looked at the resume, we've already kind of made a decision or, or got to a point on, you know, what are some of the fascinating things that we want to hear about and you know, that we want to learn about. And so I think that it's a really great tool to set up the premise. And then I'm looking for the personal statement to actually bring home the narrative of, of, of why we're in this space now. And then once I've looked at those two things, of course, I have to look at the credentials. I have to see how you have performed in your academic experience, because I'm hoping that your academic performance then um, further illustrates you know, who it is that I think I just met through the resume and through the personal statement. So I'm looking for affirmation for the person that I've just been introduced to. And so the, you know, the, 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 the marathon, which is the academic experience, uh, the point in time assessment, which is the LSAT score, um, any of the addendums, optional statements, demonstrations of leadership, these are all things that help color um, the, 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 the value of the person that I'm getting the opportunity to meet and getting the opportunity to know. So the icing on the cake is when I've, you know, actually, when I realize when reading the application that I actually met this person on the road and I can actually connect the face with it, that's kind of the icing on the cake. Not every member of the admissions committee has that opportunity, but certainly members of the admissions team have that opportunity. Uh, and so that kind of brings it all home when you're, 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 you're reading this story that you have some familiarity with because you actually spoke to the person and then you see the product that they put together. So, uh, so that's really rewarding. And that's some of the things that I look for when I go through the application. But depending upon someone's background and experience and what they're bringing to the admissions committee, they might be looking for different things. You know, members of our career services team might be looking for marketability. Uh, members of our reference uh, librarian team might be looking for, you know, analytical skills, uh, research skills, writing. That we're all going to be looking at writing. Um, um, you know, faculty might be looking at what your, you know, professional experiences are because they want to get a sense for how those activities and experiences will play out in the classroom discussion. So there's lots of different stakeholders who are looking for very different things, um, but all are unified for a common goal, which is, you know, to make sure that we select the best students who will be successful in our program and will go on to represent themselves, the profession, and the institution. <laughs> wow, that was so thorough and so helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I've got an impossible question for uh -oh. you. <laughs> I don't know if I like let's, the sound of that, David. <laughs> so let's say we live in a counterfactual world where you, you have one spot left. And you have two applicants, and they both hit your medians. They both have a 164 and a 3.62. And you want to give the nod to one of them. 
Mm-hmm. And one of them, the first one, has an amazing life story. Mm-hmm. Um, left, you know, let's say left a country with an oppressive regime, mm-hmm. supported herself by peddling books, managed to make it as a, a, a refugee to Canada or America or something, and uh, just really sort of pulled herself up by her bootstraps. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's not the best writer, but she's a fine writer, but she has that amazing life story. Mm-hmm. And the other applicant is one of the best writers you've ever seen, just mm-hmm. an amazing storyteller, knows how to spin a yarn, uh, great at self-analysis, just beautiful sentences, beautiful story, mm-hmm. but not, not an amazing life story, just a normal one. Mm-hmm. Who do you give the nod to? So the beautiful thing is that I run the department, David, so I don't have to choose just one of them. I oh, prob- you're breaking the rules. Okay. <laughs> I'd probably take them both in all honesty. Um, okay. You, 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 uh, in, my, in my profession, you rarely get into a situation where there's a nail biter. You only choose one and you have no other option, right? Um, we live in a world that, you know, we are trying to make the best decisions. And, you know, I don't know how the law school experience will play out for either one of them, right? You know, when I'm reading an application, Honestly, a lot of times when students stand out, they typically stand out for the wrong reasons. So, you know, when, when you know, I'm looking at an application, I don't necessarily go for the wow factor in every single candidate. It's just impossible. And imagine how exhausting of a community it will be full of people who are all just like, um, you know, are all like tremendous skydivers and doing all of these different things all at the same time. It'll just be, you know, it'll be haywire in the building. So I think you also, you need a balance between, you know, people who have just that wow factor and some people who are just, you know, genuinely just solid students. And they might not be, you know, super at the top solid students. They might not be, you know, at the bottom of a solid student. They just are comfortably in the middle and they're just, they, they, they've had a wonderful life. They've articulated their strengths well, and, and they're just good, you know? So I think there's room for all of that. And so I want to encourage students who are going through this process, you know, to think about, to not just think about setting yourself, standing out from the crowd, because again, with a lot of my colleagues, and I've done this for over 17 years now, um, a lot of people who over the years who've stood out in my mind were standing out for all the wrong reasons mm. and, and standing out for the wrong reasons don't get you an offer in a competitive process. Can students stand out in a good way by sure. demonstrating their interest um, either by visiting or by just writing something that sounds very authentic at the end of their personal statement about why they want to go there? And, and can that give them an advantage? Absolutely. You know, I I think you actually touched on something that's really important to me, and I think it's important to BC. It's certainly important to my admissions committee, because they all have a vested interest in who we bring through the front door, is that level of of sincerity that comes through an application is absolutely important. You know, at BC, we're, we're very blessed to have a very talented applicant pool, you know, so the vast majority of the 5,000 candidates that we see, the overwhelming majority of them are statistically within a range to get an offer from the law school already, right? Uh, and, you know, the, the, the profile of my classes online, you mentioned my medians, which is, you know, 164, 364, but the profile of my incoming class is a lot wider than that. And it's wider than that because people bring a whole array of different experiences, um, networks, and, 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 and gifts and skills that complement the community in different ways. So, you know, I, I, I you know, don't want to get all tangent there, but, you know, I, I certainly think that sincerity is something that is really important. And yes, it goes a long way. Uh, and you have to think about what sincerity and, and, and these efforts of communicating to the institution that you're really interested in the program, you know, there are different times where that is more helpful uh, than others, right? If a student is on the waiting list at our institution, you know, I welcome students. I actually have wait list preview days where uh, I do about three days in the spring semester. I typically do two of those days during spring break because I have the most space during that time. Uh, So I typically do two of those days during our campus spring break so that 
you know, I can have access to all things that are the law school and I can have a larger group just come and learn about it. And in those sessions, I talk about where we are in our process at that particular moment. I tell students what they can do. Uh, and, um, you know, depending on the size of that group, I might have individual interviews scheduled. So the first year I did that, I limited the waitlist preview days to about 20 students because we did individual interviews uh, with those students during each of the days. Um, then the second year, I didn't put that cap because I didn't do the individual interviews because I wanted to have a broader audience. But all the while in my waitlist process, uh, I communicate where we are, what we're doing, how the deposits came in, so that students have a sense of, you know, what they're waiting for, how long they might be waiting, and what the next steps might be. So in instances like that, you know, giving me a person who might have a limited, you know, time frame, and I need to select someone that I think the likelihood of them coming is pretty high, I'm going to rely on people giving you know, me a sincere message that this is the place that they want to be. It's their top choice and that, you know, we can work together to make this situation work. So, so I think sincerity goes a long way. <laughs> That's great. Okay. I'm going to ask two more questions. One's really quick before we open it up. First, just a very practical question. What if I apply and I realize after I apply that I made a typo. I have an apostrophe error in my fourth paragraph of my personal statement. Mm -hmm. Should I send a corrected version or should I just hold off because I might draw attention to it and maybe you won't notice? You should absolutely send the corrected version. We most certainly notice. So, uh, and with the committee that is as skilled and um, experienced as our committee as they will pick up on those things immediately. So, absolutely send the corrected version. It, 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 it's not going to hurt your chances. Just send us the update. Let us know what's going on. Send us the updated version and we'll add it. We won't take the other one away, but I think it does send a strong message to the committee that you took the time to correct the matter uh, and address it head on. So, That's very helpful. You're welcome. My last question is how much does law school experience matter to you and your committee as you're evaluating an applicant? I'm sorry, not law school experience, legal experience. Hmm. Uh, you know, I think it varies depending upon the applicant and, and what they're communicating. I think for a student who's on the fence and they just don't know what they want to do in the law and they, which is a lot of students to be honest with you, uh, and you know, they've not had any exposure, they don't know what to expect, I sometimes will, will, will ask, you know, have you considered an, an externship or excuse me, an internship? or, you know, perhaps volunteering or sitting in on, you know, a court hearing or something just to get familiar with, you know, what that experience may be like. So I think for some students, I do want to get a sense of, you know, have you, how, how deeply have you thought about this before jumping in? But that's usually a function of some uncertainty that they have communicated through the application. Uh, I don't require work experience in the legal profession. And quite honestly, I think the faculty would probably prefer that. I, I think you'll probably find a split. You know, some, some faculty members who value people who have had the experience because you know the work ethic that is going to be required. But that work ethic is not independent to, you know, exclusively for the, the legal industries, for any industry. And so um, I certainly value people who come with a breadth of experiences because those are, again, the experiences that are going to play out in the classroom. Uh, and they're going to help bring these, the characters that you, not the characters, but the people, the clients, the situations, the cases, they're going to help bring them to life when, you know, you're talking about a simple tort case and someone doesn't understand, well, why didn't they just do this? It's like, well, because maybe they have this background and that never occurred to them. Or, you know, there's so many different ways to approach, uh, you know, the process of legal analysis that, you know, all of those perspectives will be are welcomed in the classroom. Thank you. Let's open it up now to yeah. our participants. So we really like to hear your voice. And although we can take some questions that you type, uh, we encourage you to raise your hand and mm -hmm. just ask your question out loud. And so we'll just start with 
some people who already have raised their hands. So Jarius, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, hey, how's it going? Hi, Jarius. How's it going? I'm pretty it's good. Going good. It's going good. I'm sorry. I'm kind of stuffed up. I'm nope. a little sick, but uh, I was just curious on like my situation. So I took an LSAT that in a score I wasn't too proud of about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been studying ever since. I plan on taking it, uh, retaking it in October mm -hmm. and um, applying as soon as I get my score back. Would that be too late or how does that work? In October? Yeah, like if I took the LSAT in October and I probably would get the scores back around November, maybe early December and apply then, is that too late? Well, well, Jarius, the process is completely electronic now. So first, I think the LSAT scores are going to come out a little bit quicker. You're probably looking at a two to three week time period. But, you know, the LSAC will certainly communicate that time frame to you. Um, I think anything with a rolling admissions basis and a cycle like mine that is open from September 15th to March 31st, you know, anything before the holiday break, I would probably consider an early application. It's typically around the winter holiday break where I start to approach and then surpass my halfway point in my application volume. So typically over the winter break, I might get, you know, 2,500 applications just over that period. In which case, you know, the, the, the 1,500 or so that I've received up to like Halloween and the additional, you know, 500 between Halloween and Thanksgiving. And now you have this winter break where I'm getting, you know, 2,000, 2,500, you know, applications. We're starting to see once you get past the winter holiday break, we have passed the, the peak of that bell curve that happens in the admissions uh, cycle in terms of the application volume. So I think you're still early. Uh, long story short, I think you're still early if you're applying to BC in October. You'll still have pretty strong chances at that time. And the the fact, the the the, the component that you added there about uh, the multiple LSAT scores, um, you know, especially with LSAC offering the test in, in more opportunities for the, the the administration of the test we see a lot more students taking the test more frequently. Uh, so we will take the highest score into consideration, but bear in mind that we'll see all of those scores. The, the true correlation with LSAT scores and, and GPA is really to predict first year performance, not bar passage. And so there's actually a stronger correlation with average scores as opposed to higher scores. So in seeing all of your scores, I get a sense of what your average score is, which is your likelihood of performance in the first semester uh, of law school. But that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, outperform those, those, um, you know, uh, 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 cross points. And it also doesn't mean that you won't outperform, you know, your first year performance in your second and your third year. So it's, it's a very narrow focus that we're looking at when we're thinking about uh, how your LSAT and your GPA play a role into this process. I know that because there is a lot of weight on LSATs at, you know, most institutions in the country, students, you know, get really nervous about that. And, and I think rightfully so, and we've certainly kind of contributed to, you know, that angst that you have uh, in that our scholarships are based on, you know, scholar on, on LSAT scores and GPA. So we're certainly contributing to that. Um, but I, we will take the higher score into consideration. And, and so I want to leave you with that note. And I think the time frame that you mentioned is absolutely fine. All right. Thanks, Jarius. Thank you. Good question, Jerry's. <laughs> okay, Felipe, you can unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Hi, Felipe. <laughs> hey, Ms. Misha, can you hear me? I can. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> yes, I have a question. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a working adult who's been uh, out of this undergrad for uh, a number of years now, about three years. And I was wondering how you would approach the circumstance of letters of recommendation. I've heard that it is preferable, you know, when you can have a, a professor who's going to test to your, to your uh, critical thinking skills and academic achievements. But for, for these adults who have, you know, been out of school for a while, how, how do you suggest they should approach these letters of recommendation? 
Sure, Felipe. So this is actually a phenomenal question because I think the gauge of what a while is for students is very, very different. You know, for some students, they might consider three or four years a while. I don't necessarily consider, you know, being out of school for three or four years a long while. And I think that depending upon the institution, you might still have some relationships at your, your alma mater that you could rekindle to, to, to help in this capacity. So there's a couple of things. First off, there are many schools who require letters of recommendation. We are one of those institutions and we require two letters of recommendation. However, I think every component, every aspect of the admissions process really requires you to kind of use your best professional judgment. And if you are a student who has, you know, very few relationships with faculty at your alma mater, if you are a student who's graduated for quite some time and you don't, and maybe your faculty aren't even still there, then you've got to think, what is a letter of recommendation from a faculty member that I cannot relate to and who doesn't know me? What is that letter going to convey to the admissions committee? Well, I can tell you what it's going to convey. It's going to convey that you haven't taken the time to vet them, that they are not familiar with who they are. And so what's going to happen is they're going to give us this really pro forma letter of recommendation that really doesn't add any value to the narrative that you're hoping uh, to obtain from that letter of recommendation. So using your best professional judgment Number one, if it is an institution that requires a letter of recommendation from a faculty member, call the school, get a sense of their flexibility. If you communicate to them that, look, I've been out of school for eight years, none of my old faculty members are still there, it was a big state school experience and I didn't know my faculty members that well anyway, I don't, I'm not going to gain anything from that letter of recommendation, they may very well say, you know, well look, just you know, get, you know, letter recommendation from the best source that you can get one from. And so that's going to be my advice to you is get letters of recommendation from the best source. Be mindful of the narrative that you are creating throughout your application. So if your personal statement is giving me insight into your passions and perhaps maybe a, a specific experience that you're talking about, if your resume is highlighting some of your professional experiences, uh, if your uh, optional statement is giving me uh, aspects of adversity that you have um, or, or challenges that you've had to overcome. You know, some do a diversity statement, some do an adversity statement. You're putting different pieces of this narrative throughout your application. So then think about what component of the narrative, you know, is missing. And, and, and when you figure that piece out, is there a person is there a previous employer or a current employer? Is there a community volunteer organization that you are a part of that can deliver that narrative to, to complete the, net, the story that you're trying to create in your overall admissions packet? Hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. So did that answer your question, Felipe? Yes, I think that was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank Thanks, you. Felipe. <laughs> I'm going to read a question. Okay. As a Canadian applicant, I'm interested in understanding if there's an implicit cap on how many students yeah. outside of the U.S. are accepted. Not at all. <laughs> okay, easy to answer. No, absolutely. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. let's go to Belinda. Belinda, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, um, kind of to piggyback off Felipe's question, um, for people who, like in my instance, I've been out 20 plus years, had a second career, like complete career, what, like, what is, is there like an age-ish where people think, you know what, why, why would someone want to go to, like, is that something that's a red flag, or do y'all have any suggestions or comments about that, like older so so Belinda, my applic my actual matriculated class this year is 20 to 55 years. That's the range of students who are in my current class. In my class that just graduated, that class started at 20 years old and 
the most senior person in that class uh, started law school at 69 or 70 years old. Um, that person, and there's actually a tremendous story about that student, um, Leslie Schaff on our webpage, uh, but she's a physician, she's a mom, she's done so many things in her life. Uh, and now actually after graduation, she is teaching one of the adjunct, she's serving as an adjunct teaching a very specified health law course at the law school. So, so, that, so that's my physician. I, I was a physician and, and retired for a few years and I want to go into law. So oh, I didn't, I want yeah, I just want to make sure someone wouldn't think I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Not, at <all. laughs> Not at all, Belinda. Um, okay. And we value that. I think, you know, coming in sometimes, and this isn't, you know, exclusive to BC. I think it's just, you know, kind of one of those, you know, urban, you know, legends that are out there where, you know, coming to law school as a non-traditional student, which by the way, is defined as someone who's just over, what, 25 or 26 years old, you know, um, coming to school as a, a non-traditional student that you're just going to be in a classroom with all of these kids and, and that there's going to be such a disconnect. But I think in reality, you are in class with some of the best, the best and brightest people uh, that are out there. They, you have a natural calling. You all have a common passion wanting to pursue uh, justice in some way. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, students build off of one another. And so, you know, I used to talk to some of my younger students in the class who were um, uh, admissions ambassadors, and they would just marvel when, you know, um, when now Professor Schaff would, would, would just give a response because it would come from such a place of depth that they were just not thinking about before that really colored the way that they, you know, were able to see a particular situation. So I think that's really important to have that, uh, that value inside the classroom. You know, I, I honestly wish I could, you know, age the class a bit, um, but, you know, I'm in a college town, so it's just not really going to, it's not really in the cards for me. Um, you know, there are 50 colleges and universities just within the city limits of Boston, so you know, there's, there's, a, there's a robust population. Well, thank you. That's very encouraging. You're welcome. So, you know, I would encourage you as well. I don't know where you are located physically, but, you know, visit schools in your, and you certainly come visit Boston College, but visit other schools as well just to get a sense of what it feels like and sit in on a class and see if, you know, it's an environment that you could find yourself being comfortable in. Thank you. Thanks, Belinda. Good luck. Thank you. All right. I want to go to Brooke. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Brooke. Hello. Um, so my question is, uh, how much would you comfortably be willing to deviate from the median LSAT score if an applicant uh, excelled in other areas such as maybe work experience, community involvement, things of that nature. Brooke, I don't have a limit to, you know, how far I'm willing to deviate, but I think that every applicant who applies to the law school has, has a certain benchmark or threshold to reach. And at a bare minimum, it is a demonstration of a likelihood of success, right? So, so you know, I don't equate that to my median number. I, I, I mean, I do think there is a point at which, you know, there might be services that I can't, that I don't provide that will not be able to help a student who's at a particular point. But, you know, you know, there's always going to be an outlier who will, you know, upset that theory and will outperform whatever, you know, credential that is there. I think the farther away, um, the closer you are to the bottom of the class, I think there's a whole different phenomenon that takes on you know, you know, students are savvy. You, you know what my medians are. You know what my top and my bottom quartiles are. And when you come in and you have a sense of where you are and you see what those numbers are, sometimes that can, you know, have a negative effect on how you just approach the law school experience. So, you know, I don't have a particular point, but I do think that depending upon how the overall application uh, plays out, you know, either you have these strong, 
you know, people always say, you know, I'm not a good standardized test taker, but I have these really strong softs, you know, and I think, I don't think that they're necessarily independent of each other. I think that there is some collaboration, some, some cross functionality between those things. Uh, I, I, you know, maybe you're not a strong LSAT test taker, but, you know, having strong people skills and research skills and analytical skills, and depending upon what your major is, you might, you may have performed really well academically. I think that's a different scenario, right? If you're talking about, you know, deviating from the median on both metrics where I don't have a clear indicator of a likelihood of success, then I think the bench, the threshold for you to cross is that much higher, right? Because you've then got to convince the admissions committee that, that this is going to be a positive and fruitful endeavor for you as a student. Like, are you going to get through this program? And not just are you going to get through it, are you going to thrive? Are you going to be able to put yourself in a strong position to reach the goals that you've set for yourself? We're going to be working with you throughout your, your, your time as a student to ensure that you have the tools necessary to get there. But, you know, sometimes there are just things that are not going to happen based upon your performance, right? You know, if you are, you've got yourself, your heart set on a SCOTUS, you know, um, uh, uh, clerkship at the end of this process and you're performing at the bottom, you know, quarter of the class, the likelihood of that happening is not going to be really high immediately after law school, right? And so, you know, so, so that's all a part of this process. It's just really... I don't have a problem deviating from the median in, in, in any respect, but I think that there is a threshold that you must prove that the likelihood of success is there. Of course. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Was that helpful for you? Or? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Brooke. That's a great question. <laughs> Let's go to J Mark. Hi, J Mark. Okay, Mark, on mute. Are you there? We can't hear you. Okay. Well, we're going to have to move on to someone else. Sorry. Sorry, Jay Mark. <laughs> okay, Saba, let's, uh, let's try you. Hi, Saba. Are you there? Oh, two in a row. There's bad luck. Oh, I thought I heard something come through. All right. Saba? Okay. Let's try. Justin, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, I had a quick question about the um, financial aid portion. Sure. I, I wanted to know, inevitably students end up applying to a lot of schools because they're unsure what the application process is going to turn out like. Sure. And I think that there's an inherent ranking when, when students apply to schools, but sometimes financial aid does become a factor into this. In your role as, uh, you know, assistant to divisions of financial aid, how, how do you see money being distributed in ways that extend beyond solely the, uh, I guess, academic criteria, that's LSAT and GPA? Hmm. That's a really good question, Justin. And you're absolutely right. At many, many law schools, you know, financial aid is centered around merit-based aid. And that's pretty common. And, you know, our peer schools is common with BC. Uh, it's common with a lot of different institutions. Um, you know, there, it really is a function of you know, how a school's resources come in. I mean, sometimes, and I've worked at five different law schools, and so, so that's really kind of where my thought process is coming from. Sometimes it's a function of what alumni are hoping to do and how alumni are hoping to support students. You know, at many of the institutions where I have, you know, been employed, there was a tremendous amount of giving from the alumni toward merit-based aid scholarships, right? And so in those instances, um, each one of those schools have had really, really strong merit aid, you know, funds to work with to divvy out, to divvy out um, scholarship opportunities uh, and scholarship packages, rather. In the opposite, need-based assistance is 
you know, something I remember in the earlier days of my career, you know, you know, my institution at that time had, you know, not equal funds in both, but Meet Based Aid was still pretty popular and it was pretty robust at that institution. But when the economy, you know, took a nosedive around 2008 and then continued for a while, the need for schools to enroll students really, um, really forced schools in essence to put resources in a different place so that they could retain talent uh, and attract the best and the brightest of, of you know, the applicant pool. Uh, and that had an adverse effect on those who have tremendous need in the process. Uh, I see the remnants of that still exist. Uh, and I think most schools have still adopted the merit-based processes as opposed to uh, more broad, more broader financial aid options. But uh, just like with BC, many institutions also have special scholarship programs that do look beyond uh, need-based, excuse me, merit-based assistance. Some of those might be named scholarship opportunities. It might be public service scholars programs. It might be... Um, you know, adversity or uh, diversity or adversity scholarships. So there are a number of different ways for you to fund um, your legal education experience. If you are in a market such as, you know, the New England area, I know a lot of the different bar associations here have special scholarship opportunities that they give to students. So there's, you know, I certainly want to encourage you not only to just look uh, internally at the institution which you're matriculating to, but also look externally because those might be resources that you can take with you to whatever school that you ultimately matriculate to. Um, but regarding BC specifically, yes, we do have a strong uh, scholarship program at the law school. Uh, there are a lot of resources that are allocated towards merit-based aid. Uh, and that aid has a wide range uh, in, in which we, uh, we offer it. Uh, BC law has gone away from awarding full tuition scholarships, uh, and in doing so, we are able to go significantly deeper into the class to offer assistance towards the financing of your legal education. Our average award is generally in the neighborhood of about $20,000 per year. One difference that I will certainly say between merit and need-based aid Merit-based aid, most institutions, certainly at peer institutions, we give you a particular scholar, well, you've earned a particular scholarship, uh, and we guarantee that, I, I probably shouldn't say guarantee, but that is the idea, is that you get that scholarship for six semesters, you know, three years, um, typically it's the same award and you get that continuously for your time for six semesters uh, of your legal education experience. With need-based aid in a lot of institutions, you constantly have to reapply and be reevaluated for that award. So for example, a student who may come in as a student with a high level of need and then perhaps in your first summer you do an internship uh, at a law firm or you get a 1L associate position where it's a paid uh, position at a law firm, you may in essence disqualify yourself from need-based assistance for the second year or any year beyond that because you will have received a, a sizable income. And so, you know, I, I, I would certainly urge you to be mindful of that when you're looking at different processes, but certainly try to, you know, maximize that package to make sure that the law school experience works for you. Great, very informative, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I just have a quick follow-up question, yeah. very, very brief. Mm -hmm. um, does, I've heard in, in several instances that it does impact uh, whether or not you receive merit-based aid uh, if you apply earlier versus later. Uh, is that, does that hold true for BC? Well, we have a pretty competitive process. And so what I try to do is, we don't even consider financial aid packages until we start assembling the financial aid committee in late January. Uh, the committee's meeting over the course of February. We start releasing decisions at the end of February. Uh, and because at that period of time, 
we probably have about 80% of our 70 to 80% of our admissions decisions out there. I have the overwhelming majority of our applicant pool who will receive an offer. I, I have them in that group that's going to the financial aid committee. So it is a process because as I mentioned to you, we have about 5,000 applications uh, and a good number um, of those, we typically have somewhere between a 25 and a 28% acceptance rate uh, at the law school. So, you know, that's a pretty sizable group that's going before the financial aid committee for evaluation. Uh, and so we do roll that out uh, on a rolling basis, just like we do for the admissions offer, but it's a more confined period. So probably by the first deposit deadline, which is, you know, April 15th at BC, I've probably gone through all of the admissions applications with the exception of some of those that might be on the, the later end, in which case, once we start releasing financial aid decisions in late February, we start getting deposits. Uh, and this year kind of set the record on that. I had quite a number of deposits very early. Once we started receiving, uh, once we started releasing scholarship decisions, I started getting deposits and I started getting, some of them were just first deposits, but I started getting a lot of full deposits as well. Uh, which, you know, of course, when I start getting deposits, then the money is accounted for, you know, it's not just, you know, money that's out there and, and doesn't live, it becomes a reality. And, and, you know, it becomes, uh, we become accountable for that when we get the response from the students. So um, I do think that there is a point in the cycle where, you know, the later you are in getting through the admissions process, you start to put yourself in a position where we may not have you know, as much aid by the time we get to your application. But for the most part, they're pretty consistent because again, the factors that we're looking at, the awarding is pretty consistent. Thank you, Dean McShay. You're welcome. Uh, the only thing that I will add to that whole financial aid dynamic is be mindful of that there are schools who negotiate and there are schools who do not negotiate. Boston College is not a school who negotiates the scholarships. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I like to put that out there. And there are a growing number of schools who do not negotiate scholarships. So, you know, you've heard it here directly from me. So. <laughs> Helpful. Yeah. Okay, Radhika, you might have the last question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Radhika, you're still on mute. Okay, Radhika. I just tried to unmute you, but it looks like it's not working. Okay, let's try J Mark again, who says that the issue was resolved. Okay. Are you there? Hello? Hi, it worked. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sorry about that earlier, but um, no I had a, a kind of complex question. Okay. Um, I recently went to a couple schools after applying to them um, and I know most schools don't offer the opportunity to interview mm -hmm. um, but I kind of I wouldn't say forced but I kind of put myself in a situation where I was able to speak to um, like uh, deans and assistant deans in Ooh. several schools mm -hmm. um, and I, I would like to think that I set a good impression um, if you were in a position where a student came to you and set um, a good impression uh, while his application was still being um, reviewed, what would your um, opinion on that be? Would it be uh, too forceful or do, would you find it impressive? Uh, you know, I think there's a thin line there, right? Um, J. Mark, I think, so first of all, BC is a school who kind of welcomes visitors. And so, you know, as I mentioned early on in the call, I typically sit down with our tour group that comes just to, you know, if I'm available, I'll go in the room and sit and get to know people and talk with them. I think impressions are important. And, and I think that's a two way street impression that you get from the institution in terms of, you know, our, our, our accessibility and from your perspective, you know, your professionalism and judgment. Now, in terms of forcing your way into an interview, that has the opportunity um, to go far left for you. And so I want you to be mindful of that going through the process because it could go left for you. And if it does, you know, there's probably not much you can do to salvage that situation. So I would be mindful of that. I think many of my colleagues 
Um, some are more accessible than others, but I think of those who have made themselves accessible, you know, I, I think simply reaching out to them, if you're really looking for something more substantive in terms of a conversation with an admissions professional, if you're looking at the dean level or the director level, um, then, you know, certainly make time for them. Uh, just to give you a sense of what my day looks like, you know, I can go in the office. I, I typically have meetings that start at 9 a.m. So I try to be at the school around 8.30 to 8.45 at the least so that I can have a moment to take a breath before I jump into my day. I typically, I'm a morning person, so I like to have my morning jam packed so I can be in meetings from 9 a.m. to 12, 12.30. And then once I'm done with that, I go and meet with the tour group at you know 12.45 or one o'clock whenever they're done. And then I have a couple of projects. Then I'm able to do work and answer emails and phone calls and all of those different things. I typically get, um, on a normal day, about 80 email messages a day. If I send out some type of solicitation to the applicants, I might get an upwards of 200 emails a day. If I do a law forum or a law fair, you know, every last one of those students will follow up and I try to follow up as quickly as they do, right? Um, so, so, you know, just kind of making an interview when there's no real room for that can get really tricky. And so I want you to be mindful of that. But if I had the opportunity to sit with someone and they left a, a lasting impression, I, depending on where they are in the cycle, if they're in, actually, I would probably make a comment. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, 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 I like to take notes because I reflect on those notes and those experiences when I give my orientation speech. Uh, so, so I keep track of those pieces of information. I keep track of, you know, hilarious emails and, you know, different things. And sometimes I keep track of the ones that are not so hilarious and the ones that are downright rude. Uh, I think the, 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 the deeper challenge that I have with the, the just setting up an interview is, I mean, just, you know, making an interview when there's no opportunity is that it diminishes the value uh, uh, of the conversation with the front line staff, you know, I value everything that my front line, that my front line admissions team has to say about a candidate. So when they encounter a person who will not give them the time of the day and only wants to speak with me, for me, you know, it, it, it doesn't bode well because then I think, how will that student behave? As, how will that person behave as a student here? How will they behave, you know, if they, you know, are, are in their first year summer associate position or, or their first year internship and their direct supervisor gives them something that they don't want to hear and they just go above them and around them? Like, that's, that's not something that I want to support. So don't underestimate the value of those people who are standing on the front line because if, if the person who manages my front operations comes to me and say, hey, I just met the most amazing student, I'm going to pull up that application, I'm going to look at them, and I'm going to ask, well, what made you think that? And I might make a comment even in that instance, right? Um, and sometimes just for, for um, uh, the, process, the sake of the process, I sometimes answer the general email box. I sometimes answer the, the, the main line for the, uh, for the office just to get a sense of, you know, what types of questions are coming in so that I remain relevant to the whole process. So, um, you know, I, I, I would value the, the meeting. If I have the opportunity to meet with a student and they leave a good impression, I would value that. But again, I, I urge you to take caution in how you set up those arrangements. Okay. Understood. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been very thorough with all these questions, so I really appreciate it. Oh, Jay Mark, my pleasure. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Dean McShay, I'll just echo that. Um, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your candor and your insight. You know, I really got the sense during this conversation, both of how you work in a, in a very vivid way and also how other people might work differently. Mm -hmm. And on the whole, it just helped us really understand that on the other end of the application, there are very thoughtful, very hardworking people trying to do their best um, by the class and just making very difficult decisions. So I, I think it really humanized the process. And uh, I just, I, I want to thank you again for doing this. 
David, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, the nearly 200 people that were on here at one point. Thank you for your time. I know you might be, you know, joining from all over the country, all over the world, arguably. Uh, so I hope that you will strongly consider BC. Um, you know, it's a wonderful community and I look forward to getting to know you all in, in some capacity. I'll be on the road. Feel free to visit our webpage uh, to see where we'll be on the road. I typically do a lot of the national forums for LSAC. And so you'll see me at almost all of the major forums around the country. Um, so thank you all so much, David. This was certainly a wonderful thing. I would normally be heading to bed right now, um, but this has been fantastic. So I appreciate your time and, and for giving me this opportunity. So. Okay, well, uh, thanks for staying up for us. And everyone else, you're now free to go to bed. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. <laughs>